These moments take me all the way back to, okay, so they didn't have move when I was in high school, but we did have times during the summer when we would go to camp, Bible camp, church camp. And, and, and it, we always had Friday, you know, because Friday is the last day. It's the day you don't think about when you first show up. But then as Friday begins to loom and you realize, whoa, this is it, this is the last day. Those two little words start bouncing around in our heads. This week you have had some great worship. Can I get oh yeah? Man, just, you guys have sung your lungs out. Some of you are hoarse after singing sessions. You're Man, it's like the holy mosh pit down here. Yes, right? And then those words come flying over the fence. So what? We've heard all these great speakers, man. The, the encounter classes and the speakers. And so what? Yeah, but in our group, so-and-so shared. And she said, and he said, and I said. Everybody say it with me. So what? That is the text they've challenged me with tonight. The question of contrast. Now, there's a lot of contrast words we've used. You got your coin with you? Get your coin out. I want you to hang on your coin for a second. All week long, CIY has given us this beautiful image of one of these things is not like the other, right? So, uh, so hold on your coin. I'm going to give you a word. You shout back its opposite. We'll see how easy this is. Here we go. Ready? High. High. Big. Small. Short. Small. Before. After. Ah, so what? Yeah. You see, when I think about the two, the two sides of this coin of before and after, I think about what God is up to this week. Because if we treat this week like, oh man, it was cool, it was awesome, it was wonderful, we get right back in our vans and our buses and we go home and we live no differently, dude, Satan will pay for move every year until Jesus comes if he can make us think we're actually doing something by just showing up, by just being here. I apologize if that feels offensive, but I remember so going to camp and all those emotional times at camp, and you get so, yes, yes, I just love Jesus, I just love Jesus. Man, by the last night when we're, you know, having the Devo around the fire and we're all singing, if Satan showed up, we'd kill him with our bare hands. We were just like, yes, yes. We were just warriors for the Lord, right? Youth ministers would always do the same thing. They would always go... Okay, does anybody want to say anything about what camp meant to them? Fifteen girls' hands went up. <laughs> one, of them would, one of them would stand up, you know, come to the front. <laughs> I just want to say it. <laughs> I just want to say it. Let me get so much. This has been so good to me. Now. It changed my life. And all the other girls go, yes, yes! <laughs> and after eight or nine girls, finally, you know, come on, one of you boys, Bob, come on up. You know, big old football player, and he gets up there, and he's like, well. <clears throat> I just want to say... I just love you guys. Okay, that's it. That's it, right? You know, and then he walks off. But after we have this holy love fest of, yes, this is so awesome. This is it. This is it. The next day. We go home just the same. Bickering and fussing and complaining and focusing on self. I want to dare you to do differently this week. I want to dare you to do differently today. Hold your coin. Just hold it. In fact, completely cover it in your hand so you can't see it. 
As you do, I'm going to ask you to think about somebody flipping a coin for you. And the two sides of the coin could be before and after. Are you going to go home the same as you were before? Or are people going to be able to say, you know what, there's just, dude, there's something different. What's up, man? You just, you're different after. After the experience you had with God. After the time you had of thinking about light and about dark and about, you know, believe and, and deny and, and about, you know, obey and rebel. There's just, it's, there's something going on, man. You're different. That's the answer to the so what. But the challenge is, is it going to be just like somebody just flips the coin and that's whatever it is each day you get up? Or is there, or is it possible for there to be this spirit-filled, underlying commitment that says, I am going home different. I am going home changed not because of me a speaker or because of a band I'm going home changed because Jesus Christ has showed me what it's like to live a contrasted life a different life he has called me to love to obey to serve now that the reality is we cannot do this on our own because we don't have what it takes because I remember going home from camp, like, yes, yes, yes. I want to read my Bible every day. It lasted two days. I'm not going to use that language anymore, man. I'm not going to look at porn. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And it lasted maybe three or four days. It was kind of like the relationships we made at camp. <laughs> Just saying. Come on, let's be real. The first day, the first day you get there, you're like talking and then all of a sudden, dude, who is that? What? The blonde over at that table. Who is that? She's looking. Shut up. She's looking. She's looking. What church is she from? I don't know, man. Good night. She is just, wow. Wow. Day two, you're, you're looking, you're scoping it out in the cafeteria. She's got to be in here. She's got to be in here. I saw her earlier. She's gonna be, there she is. There she is. Don't look. Don't look. Are you going to go over there? Stay here. I'll go with you. No, you won't. Stay here. <laughs> you try and be so cool, you know. Anybody uh, sitting there? Can you sit down? You introduce yourself. Oh, you're from there. Oh, yeah. Whatever she says, you love it. Justin Bieber, my favorite too. You know, I mean, you're just, you're into it. And at camp, by Wednesday night at camp, you negotiate to sit by him at campfire and pray that the youth minister got up, the youth pastor got up and said, okay, let's finish with a, with a prayer. Let's all stand up and let's join hands. And you awkwardly held hands. And you were trying hard to think about Jesus during that prayer. <laughs> and the big moment came when they said, in Jesus' name, amen. And she didn't let go. Oh. Oh, yeah. You walk away from the fire, a thing. Everybody's like, look, it's a thing. <laughs> and the relationship is just like, boom, man. The next day, you're picking your names for your future children. I mean, it's just Zoom. <laughs> and by the time Friday comes, it's like, no, no. And they come on, we got to get in the bus. You got to get in your van. No, they pull you apart like Romeo and Juliet. And she is like crying. Okay, I'll call, you know, today. I'll text you. I'll text you on the way down the hill. Bye. Oh, my, my. She gets, she cries all the way home in the van. He gets in the van and goes, oh, dude, Fortnite. Whoa, man. All right. <laughs> the danger. Okay, the danger is that we do the exact same thing with God. 
is that we have this kind of puppy crush on God of yes, yes, oh yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to deny, I want to believe, I, I don't want to, I don't want to rebel, I want to obey, I don't want to be dark, I want to be light. And so they've just dropped the bomb on us with this last moment, and here it is. High, big, tall, love. Yeah, I know. See, hate is the natural response, the opposite of love. But according to Jesus' best friend, his BFF John, John writes and says, let me tell you what really the opposite of fear is. In fact, take a look at this text. Let's see if we can read this text together from his little letter. John, 1 John 1, 4, 19. I'm going to ask you guys to hit the red good and hard. Let's see if we can do this. Now, he talks about this love that should be in us, that we should be taken home, that should make us different after this. Such love has no... Because... Expels all... Now, if, 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 if we are afraid, it is for... Of punishment. And that shows that we have not fully experienced his... We... Each other... Because he us first now there's so much there we're going to unpack fast first off you say wait a minute i thought hate's the opposite of love and john says good question question man but you're wrong there because hate is a passion right love is a passion fear is the thing that draws you back and holds you back from love if you love someone and, and you, you want to tell them or, or you want to express it or if you love someone and you want to do something good for them fear says oh, no 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 no, 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 no. It's not going to be hate because, man, I love them. But fear says, no, 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 no. What is somebody going to say if you do that? How will they respond? Maybe they won't like you. And even though you're trying to be kind to them, maybe they'll be a jerk to you. As a Christian, as a young person, I totally messed that verse up. Because when I saw the words perfect love, everybody say perfect love. When I saw the words perfect love, I thought, okay, okay, okay. The way I go home different is I'm going to go home and be a perfectly loving person. I'm going to go home and love perfectly. Oh, man. Oh, man. So bad. And I don't just mean when I was your age. I mean still. I wanted my love chart to go like this. Yes. Instead, it's... it's uh, uh, let me make it easy for you to understand. Um, I have a son named Spencer. He's my youngest son. And Spence went through a time in uh, middle school where he got to read books that he loved so much. Some of the series books. I don't forget whether Potter or what it was he was reading, but he was just way into this series. And he would not quit reading at night. And so he would read, even after lights out, until 2 or 2.30 in the morning. So in the morning, he would sleep in and miss the bus. Or worse... We started getting letters from his middle school teachers. Dear Pastor Walling, you know, they knew that I was a minister. Your son fell asleep again today in chemistry. Could it be that you are keeping him up too late? Did she just accuse, what do we think? Hey, let's go to the bar, man. Come on, you know, I mean, really? Let's watch another 10 episodes on Netflix, man. I mean, really? I went to Spence and I said, you fell asleep, dad, she's so boring. I said, I don't care. We got notes from chemistry, from English, and from his PE teacher. <laughs> they were supposed to do one day, they were supposed to do this mile run. And he just said, he found a tree and laid down behind it and slept. <laughs> so I am like so angry and so embarrassed that I said, that's it. And I took his books. I just took them. I went into his room. It was like the Taliban. We will take these from you. You know what I mean? I, I, mean, I, t I took all his books you cannot read, you know? <laughs> People hear this story and go, that's so sick. No, you don't understand. It was like an addiction. He could not stop. We took all his books. He started borrowing them from friends, sneaking them home, you know? <laughs> like drugs, stick it under the mattress, man. <laughs> and then at night, he would get them out and get a flashlight. And I became the little reading Nazi because I'd see the light under the door. And if it's after 11, because that's it, you're going to bed at 11 o'clock, you know. If it's like 11.30, 11.45, and I see the lights on the door, boom, I'm jumping, tipping that book, you know. <laughs> then one night, 
I'm up at 2 o'clock. Some say, why are you up at 2 o'clock? <laughs> Live long enough and you'll find out. But um, <laughs> I'm coming back from the bathroom at 2 o'clock and I spot, <laughs> I spot the light under the door. Two? Really? Really, Spence? And I went down the hallway and threw open the door. He just laid there. Then he moved. And I realized he'd fallen asleep reading. There's a book open. He had his little, you know, flashlight. And I'm like, oh. I went over there to yank him out of bed. And then I saw what the book was. He was preparing for his first mission trip with our church. And he had been copying scripture down in his book. Now, you've got to know as a parent, you're like, oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that this is what my kid is is into. And I just got on my knees and thank God that he had such a good mom who has been a good example to him. I mean, here I am, a pastor, and I'm like, I, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I was about to, to shake his cage because this God, thank you, thank you for showing me home. Just what a, what a good kid he is. And I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm bawling, right? I take the book and I put it up, and the little flashlight. And he had his glasses on, which you're not supposed to sleep with your glasses. So I take them off. But they scraped his ears when I took them off. And he wakes up. Okay, I totally love him at this moment. And he, Dad, and I said, okay, buddy, I love you. I love you. you. It's late, but, you know, I love, you were writing scripture, man. I love that. I love that. Go to sleep, bud. I hit the lights off, but before I could get out of the room in the darkness, I hear, Dad? I said, yes, Spence. He said, would you run downstairs and give me a glass of water? <laughs> what? Can you just run down and just give me a glass of water? Can, with ice, please? I turned the light back on. You want me to like run downstairs and get you some water? Let me tell you what you're going to do. You're going to run down the stairs and then run back up 15 times right now because you are not obeying. I told you nothing after 11. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. He's like, but dad, don't give me but dad. Oh, that's okay. Tomorrow I'm getting you up at 5 o'clock and you're going to drink a gallon of water. I will pour cup after cup after cup. Wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture, right? One minute I give him my lungs. Another minute I won't give him a glass of water. What's wrong with this picture? My love. Oh, come on, you, you know what it's like. Oh, my mom's so great, I love her. And then she says, no, you can't go. She is such a jerk, I don't know why. You know, bum, 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 bum. And so I'm like, okay, God, how is this perfect love? Everybody say perfect love. How is this perfect love? And I know you talked about this morning, and surely, I'm sure the encounter teacher said, no, it's not our love. It's his love. Understand a couple principles. Fear will keep us from loving. But love can make us fearless. Fear can keep us from being loving. But if we experience God's love, if we get how much he loves us, here's what John says about it. We know what real love is, not fake love, not phony love, not pretend love. We know what, everybody say real love. Real love is because Jesus did what? Gave up his life for us so we ought also to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. John says, guys, has it hit you yet? That it didn't cost 100 bucks or 200 bucks or 300 bucks for you to come here and have moved. It cost the blood of Jesus Christ for you and I to have hope in life. It doesn't cost a little bit of time on Sunday morning for you to, you know, be right with God. It costs Jesus whipped and mocked and beaten and stripped and hung on a cross. He did that out of love. I, I don't know when I first heard the phrase, that people say, you know, they nailed Jesus to hold him to the cross. Wrong. Jesus was the son of God. Jesus could do miracles. You can't get big enough nails to hold him up there. It wasn't nails that held him to the cross. It was love. It was his choice. It was him saying, I will do this. One, praise God. 
because he was obedient to his father and he took my place and yours. Amen? But two, praise God, he said, I don't want them to wonder if I really love them. And anytime they wonder, anytime some jerk tells a young lady that only if she would do this would she be really lovable. Maybe if she looked like that, she'd be really lovable. Maybe if she let her boyfriend do this, then they'd really have a loving relationship. Jesus says, I don't want her to believe that lie for one minute. She is loved right where she is by me and by my Father. For God so loved the world. I don't want any guy out there to think that he's only going to be a stud, he's only going to be a man, he's only going to be tough if he, fill in the blank, does drinks or does drugs or takes his girlfriend to bed. He's only going to be that if he proves to his gang it's a lie. The cross is all about God saying, I love you this much. Oh, but man, all the mistakes I've made. Yeah, yeah, he knows. And praise God, he loves you anyway. But the deal is, the love is what changes us. It's what makes us go, wow, thank you. Thank you, Lord. What, what can I do? I mean, you've given me heaven, you've given me life, you've given me grace. And Jesus says, well, um, I told you what to do. In fact, i got to believe that when John was writing 1 John, he was reflecting back on that night. That night night when Jesus sat down with them around the Passover table. John wrote about it in John chapter 13. Jesus says this, he says, my children, he speaks to the disciples like little kids, my children, I'll be with you only a little longer. Oh man, if John were here, he would say, guys, everybody went, what? Because they'd spent the last three years just following Jesus. That's what a disciple is, a follower. They just follow him around wherever he goes. And Jesus says, okay, guys, um, peace out. I'm leaving. What? You can't leave? What do you mean? And where I'm going, you cannot come. Just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I'm going, you can't come. But a new command I give you. Love one another, even as I've loved you. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. But of course, they weren't listening because Peter's hand immediately goes up in the text. Peter says, I have a question. And he's just like a little kid when mom and dad say, okay, grandpa, grandma, I'm going to take care of you. We're gone for the weekend. I have a question. <laughs> where are you going? Peter asks him, where are you going? And Jesus says, you, you, you can't go. And Peter's like, I want to go. Peter thinks he's going to Disneyland, right? I want to go. He doesn't know he's going to Mount Calvary to be stripped and beaten and mocked and whipped for you and me. Jesus says, guys, this is the big one. The last command. Final words. Here they are. Love one another. Say it with me. Love one another another. Jesus has already challenged them to say, I want you to love your neighbors, you'll love yourself. And he says, by this will all men know. It's not our CIY hats. It's not our I love Jesus t-shirts. It's not our Jesus is my homie baseball caps. It is us loving one another that causes people to go, wow. That's like different. That's a contrast. Coming from California, the easiest way for me to talk about what I'm challenging you to is to talk about earthquakes. Earthquakes are serious business for us. Two questions you ask when an earthquake happens. First question is, man, what, how big was that? Because if it's like a 3.5 or a 4.5, no big deal. But if it's a 5, if it's a 6, then all of a sudden... This could mean houses came down. This could mean friends and people you know. This could mean freeways collapsed. So the second question you ask is, where was the epicenter? Can everybody say epicenter? epicenter. 
Okay, that's a, that's a huge word in California because the epicenter is the very center because earthquakes aren't like, uh, 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 it's right here and then it goes boom, boom, boom out. Here, let me show you. Here's a map of an epicenter for an earthquake that was in, down in Mexico and that little star down there is the very center of it. Okay, if you're at the center of the, air, the, of the earthquake, it's big, but the earthquake just goes like this. What John is calling us to do leaving here in just a couple of minutes, is to say, I want you to be the center of the Jesus earthquake. I want you to be the epicenter. Everybody say epicenter. So take your hand like this and put it in your other hand and say epicenter and then go like that. Yeah, okay. So watch, watch how this works. The epicenter, oh, I got to say something hard. Okay, I'll try and do it quick. Sometimes we go to stuff like this and we see things about other countries and we think, yeah, that's it. I want to go over there and be a Jesus earthquake. Okay, the epicenter starts where you live. It's kind of a little nuts for us to go all the way to Africa or all the way to Haiti or all the way to Ireland or all the way on a mission trip to, you know, some poor part of the United States and love people and care about people and come home and be jerks in our house. Are you tracking with me on this? Everybody say epicenter. So let's just make this super, super practical. John writes and says this. He says, if somebody has enough money to live well and and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? And here's the kicker. Dear children, let us not merely... What's the next word? How many here... Love Jesus. Can I get an oh yeah? yeah. How many here want to obey Jesus? Can I get an oh yeah? yeah. So that means that you love your family. Epicenter. So here we go. You get on your van. You get on your bus. You get out in the parking lot. There's mom. Hey, how was it, right? You know, dad gets your stuff and you get in the car. You are so tired. And then your little brother or sister, get in the back seat with you. How was it? How was it? Was it fun? Was it fun? What'd you do? What'd you do? What'd you do? And you're like, knock it off. Just, I'm just tired. I got a headache. We didn't sleep for about four days. All I ate was red licorice. I am just so worn out. And your mom said, well, tell us something. Tell us something you learned. Mom, please, please, your little brother. What was it? What was it? What was it? You're like, I'm going to send you to be with Jesus in just a minute here, man. <laughs> and finally, your dad's like, hey, 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 now, come on now. Come on now. Tell us something you learned. Tell us something you Dad, I'm tired. Hey, bud, tell us something you learned. Okay. I learned to love people. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture, right? Everybody put your hand like this and go, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. We want to be the epicenter. We want to be the epicenter. So let's back it up. You get off the bus. You get off the van. You remember, yes, 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 yes. I made a commitment because Jesus so loved me, I'm going to love everybody. Who's the first person? Oh, crumb, it's my little sister. Okay. Okay, okay. So you get in the car. And when your little sister or little brother, how was it, how was it, how was it? You say, can I tell you something? And they're like, what? And you say, You know, I thought about you while I was there, and I prayed about you, because I hope one day you're going to get to do something like that, because I think you are going to be an awesome Christian leader. Now, up front, your mom will begin to weep silently. (laughs) Your dad behind the wheel is going to go, he's on drugs. And they'll both think, okay, that's, that's weird, but he'll get over it. And then you get home. And instead of throwing your junk down, you'll say, Mom, where do you want, to put, you want me to put this? You want me to put this in the dirty clothes or you want me to start a load of laundry? <laughs> what, 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 what did you say? <laughs> it's dinner time. Mom starts setting the table and you come in. Let me help. Or better, dinner's over. You jump up. I got dishes tonight. <laughs> Everybody go, Pfft. yes. Every, one more time, go, Pfft. say epicenter. 
guys, this is the real deal. This is not some kind of fantastical complex thing. Love other people and start at home. Start at home. And just keep it going. Just keep it going because the next day you're going to go to church, right? Sunday, you're going to go to church. Woo! Oh, epicenter. Dude, epicenter. Okay, so I'm in the lobby. Epicenter. What do you normally do, right? Normally you run for the visitor donuts. Hey, man, I want a donut, you know? And you know that old lady with a cane you nearly knock over? Can you stop for half a second and turn around and take a good look at her? Because let me tell you how hard it is for her to get up and just get to church. Her husband died several years ago. She's tired, quite frankly, she's lonely. She's got pains from arthritis, but she gets up and she gets dressed and she comes to that church. And when the little collection plate or whatever goes by, she opens up her little hands and puts a few bucks in, which is huge to her because she wants to support your youth ministry. Because she wants to make it possible for you to come to stuff like this. Because she believes that Jesus so loved the world that somebody's got to tell. And she's hoping you will. So what if you didn't just run for the goodies but said, excuse me, I don't know that I know your name, but I see you here all the time and I just want to say you're a real example to me. Thank you. Is there something I could be praying for you about? Now, if that sounds freaky and bizarre to you, okay. But let me tell you what it is. It's just loving people. It's just getting our eyes off of, where do I want to go to lunch and who am I going to sit with? And when you walk into the teen room, instead of making fun of everybody and laughing and joking, when you see that new person come in or that person who comes in that is always like, ah, nobody wants to pay attention to them. Hey, man, come sit here. And maybe even going up to your youth leader, your youth sponsor, especially those youth volunteers after the class is over and going, man, thank you. I, I appreciate what you do. And I probably have been a jerk in class sometimes. And I just want to say I'm trying to change that and I'm sorry. Everybody say epicenter. Yes. And then you go to, oh my goodness, flash forward a, a, a couple of months, you go to school. You go to school. And all of a sudden you're like, oh no, oh no. I know you're all going, no. And... <laughs> And Satan says, yeah, that's right, man. Hate school. Hate the teachers. Hate it all. And Jesus says, epicenter. <laughs> what would that be? Let's just start in homeroom. Can you imagine if all day long, every maybe you said, hey, what are you doing Sunday? Man, we got this cool thing going on in our church. I'd love to have you go. What are you doing? There? We've got this evening deal that we're doing. Or maybe just, hey, you're in the cafeteria, and instead of where's my friends, where's my friends, you look around for somebody who doesn't have anybody sitting by him. You pull a Jesus move. And you look around and you spot somebody who doesn't have anybody sitting by him. Hey, Zacchaeus, can I have lunch with you? <laughs> Serious. You go over to the table. I don't know what table it is. I don't know if it's a table who can't speak English well, and so that's why they you know, feel all uncomfortable. I don't know if it's a table because their skin is a different color from maybe everybody else in their class. Or I don't know if it's a table where there aren't chairs. There are wheelchairs. And it never occurs to us to drag a chair over there and say, somebody's sitting here. And maybe to chat with somebody who feels so much like they are invisible because they happen to be disabled. And angels are going, yes, 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 yes. And Satan is saying, I hate that. Because when you and I start loving and we start caring, Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples by the way that you, say it with me, love one another. And yes, it goes from home to church to school to city to country to global and that will change the world. That will change the world. That's the so what. That's the so what. The so what is so it's going to be different. Say it with me. It's going to be different. It doesn't have to be big and flashy. It doesn't have to have a movie made about it. It just starts right where you are. And you say, I'm going to love you like Jesus loved me. Because he put a high bar. He said, love one another even as I have loved you. Which means you love even when they're jerks. 
and you love even when they don't appreciate it, and you love even when they are laughing at you while you're dying. You see, when Jesus was up on the cross, everybody didn't go, oh, that's so awesome that you're doing this. While Jesus was up on the cross, they laughed and mocked and made fun of him. They didn't know, right? They didn't know they were going to be the villains in the story for centuries later. They didn't know they were going to be the jerks. They didn't know they're going to be the part of VBS nobody wants to play, (laughs) right? Who wants to be the person that kills Jesus, you know? I want to be Thaddeus. Can I be Thaddeus? I want to be Peter. I want to be John, right? So Jesus does this. Father, forgive them. Because they do not know what they're doing. So when you get home and you start loving and somebody is a jerk to you or somebody makes fun of you or somebody mocks you, just remember Jesus walked that same road. What a crazy thing to think about what the next year, no, five, no, 10, 20 could bring if we all got our eyes off our stinking selfies and started looking for people to love. Oh, by the way, That's how you change the world. Because that's what Jesus did. So here's what we're going to do. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something you do not see coming. Because there is no stinking way we can do this if we take these home like this. There's no way if I just, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. First off, I've got to recognize how much God loves me because it's his love that changes me. Second, if you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, you need to do that. If you've never been baptized into Christ, you need to do that. That death, burial, and resurrection, I am praying you will make that choice because it is the best choice you will ever make anywhere, anytime, anyhow. Amen? Okay. Because we desperately need the Spirit's power. So here's the challenge, guys. Here's the challenge. I'm going to ask you to do something very bizarre with your coin. Don't take it home. You say, wait a minute. I wrote, I wrote, an, I wrote my name on it. I wrote somebody else's name on it. I'm going to flip it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's what I want you to do. you got 30 seconds to do this. I'm going to give you 15. I want you to swap coins with somebody around you. Maybe somebody in your youth group. Maybe somebody behind you. I want you to swap coins. Swap a coin. Maybe it's somebody you know, maybe it's somebody you don't. Find somebody and get your coin swapped. And then I want you to wrap their coin up in your hand and hold it right here at your chest. Just hold it right here. And I want you to hold it right here while I tell you this. Here's what's going to happen. I want to give you a visual picture and then I want you to look at the name on the coin. One of those names is that person's. The other's name is somebody else's. Every day for the next 30 days, here's what you're going to do first thing when you get up in the morning. You're going to do that, and then you're going to say, okay, today I pray for them. And you say a prayer for them. Or today I'm praying for their friend that they're going to share Jesus with. They're going to love like Christ. And each time you flip it, I want you to realize they're doing the same thing. Satan will try and stop you. He'll say, this is stupid, forget about it. You just decide. Everybody say, so what? what? Everybody say, so this. this. I I would be thrilled to give Satan a terrible month. How about you? How about we just give him a terrible month? Because 2,000 teenagers and adults are going to be praying for people and are going to be talking to people and they're going to be loving to people and they're going to be doing push, that. And people are going to be staring and saying, whoa, what's up? And we get to say, Jesus, that's what's up, buddy. And that's what you need in your life, friend. And when it feels silly or when it feels small or when you don't see I was in middle school, and I found myself on a Saturday watching 
a movie, a chick flick movie, one of these Saturday afternoon movies where a mom's got cancer and the dad's not in the picture and she's got two kids and the guy is, you know, in high school and the girl's a little older and she and her son are all at odds and mom's got cancer and you know what's going to happen. You know, you know, right? I should have shut this stupid thing off and gone outside and played, but it just hooked me. It just hooked me because the boy was my age. And I thought, because he couldn't tell his mom he loved her. He was upset because the dad leaving, which had happened years before, being a single parent, his mom had done her best, but he was angry. And then she gets cancer. And you know what's going to happen, but he's like blind. There's a scene towards the end where his sister pushes him up against the wall in the hallway of the hospital and says, Ben, listen to me. She's dying. She's she's not going to listen to me. Our mother is dying. And the best thing you can do is stop being a jerk and get in there and, and tell her you love her. This is it, buddy. I'm sorry, but this is the hand we get dealt. So don't regret for the rest of your life you didn't say you love her to that woman. The sister walks off and I'm watching and I'm thinking of me. I'm thinking, you know what? I don't tell my mom I love her very much. I t- oh. So I start rooting for him. Come on, do it, do it, do it. And sure enough, he sets his jaw and walks into the hospital room. He goes over and sits down by his mom. She's lost all her hair. She's wearing one of those scarf things. She's watching the TV. And you can tell he's like stealing up to do it. And I'm like, say it, say it, say it. And he goes, Mom, I got something I got to tell you. And she's like, what now? That's what she expects, right? And he says, I, I haven't. And then the door to the hospital room opens and an orderly comes in. I'm sorry, I got to change the IV. Ba- oh, is this a bad time, you know? And the mom is like, no, no, come on. And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I- I'm going to go to the bathroom. Oh, no, no, no. The camera is brilliant. The camera follows him all the way down the bathroom. And he gets in the bathroom and he starts putting water on his face. Just, just throwing water on his face. And then you see him look up in the mirror and there's water and there's water. And you realize it's not the water he put there. He's bawling. And he looks in the mirror and he practices. Mom, I have I haven't been the son you deserve. And I just want to tell you I love you. And you're the best mom in the world and I'm I am glad I had you and I wouldn't want any other more water. He finally controls himself and then you're like, yes! And I'm waiting for the payoff. He walks down the hallway and he begins to smile. It's like the sun is just like finally and he walks in the room and he sits down beside her and he kind of puts his head down so he's not distracted and he just starts in. Mom, Mom, I want to tell you I haven't been the son you deserve but Mom, I want you to know I love you and I am so thankful She's not looking at him. She's laying completely still. And slowly you're like, no! And he reaches over and takes her hand and you can tell she's gone. She died while he was in the stinking bathroom. And I'm yelling at the stupid team, no! No! But the director was so brilliant. He just had the boy keep hold of the hand and just say it. Mom, I love you. And you're the best mom in the world. And I'm sorry I didn't tell you, but I'm telling you now, I, I wouldn't have wanted any other mom. And he puts his head down on her hand and just movie ends I'm there bawling and wiping my eyes saying that was so stupid that was just stupid 
dumb movie if my sister saw me, I'd be toast. So I'm like trying to get it together. And I headed out to the backyard, but as I did, I walked through the dining room and I saw my mom in the kitchen. And she's standing at the sink and she's doing the dishes from lunch. I couldn't, I couldn't stop. I ran in the kitchen crying and threw my arms around her from the back and just said, Mom, I love you, and I have been the son you deserve, and you're awesome, and I, I don't want any other mom, and you're just, I love you. And she stopped, and she turned around and said, Are you all right? <laughs> and I said, Yeah, I just, I'm sorry. I just, I just need to tell you, Mom, you're awesome, and I love you, and I want to and I want to I want to be better. I want to I want to love you better and I kissed her on the cheek. And then she broke my heart. She said, "Are you serious?" And I said, "Oh, mom, I'm totally serious. I mean it." And she said, "Then do the dishes." <laughs> I did. Out your head. Father, God, um, we need to go home and do the dishes. We do, Lord. We need, we need to go home and actually do stuff. We need to serve our dads and moms. We need to serve our little brothers and sisters. We need to serve at our church. We need to, serve. God, we need to love at our schools and we need to, and we need to care more about others than what they can give us and we need to give more than we're taking. And Father, we need to go home and tell our friends that Jesus is the light and the way and the truth and hope and joy and forgiveness. Father, may your love wash over these teens right now. And Father, for the first time, Lord, when they, in just a second, flip that coin and say a prayer for either their friend or, or their friend's friend. May this begin an, the epicenter of a Jesus earthquake all across cities and states and ultimately all across the world. Father, I pray for those who need to give their heart and life to Jesus that after this session they'll grab a youth minister, a youth sponsor, and just say, I need to talk to you about this. I want to do this. And God, for baptisms that may happen tonight at churches or Sunday at churches. And Father, I pray for those of us who are going to go home and are going to call a friend and say, you're coming with me to church on Sunday. Because let me tell you, this is worth it. It'll make a difference from before to after. Thank you, God, for letting Jesus be our so what. Thank you for John's beautiful words that Jesus showed us real love. And God, whenever anybody, when we get home, starts complimenting us or saying how awesome it is that we're acting different, Father, may we be smart enough to give you all the glory and give you all the praise and say, it ain't me, it's Jesus Christ alive in me. Please, God, help us do that. I pray in Jesus' holy name and all that agree say, amen. Take your coin. Take your coin and flip it. Now bow your head and quietly pray for whatever name came up. And if you don't have a coin, will you bow your head and pray for somebody you love right now that you need to share Jesus with? And then we'll worship together for the last time. Take a moment and do that.